Hey everybody, what's up? This is Nick. Uh, real quick, I want to play a little game with you guys. I want to play two recordings uh, with a pilot and ATC, and each recording is from a different pair of headsets. And I want you, based off the clarity of the message and recording, to guess how much each headset was. So let's hear headset one first. Playing 294 Julia Yankee, go out to the ground on a 27 right, taxi via Alpha Delta, cross one 35. 27 right via Alpha Delta, cross 35. Okay, that was headset one, and now let's hear headset two. Number 7462 Mike, runway 27 right, taxi via Charlie. 62 Mike, going to Sky Harbor. Number 62 Mike, Roger. All right, Sky Harbor via Charlie, 62 Mike. All right, so what did you guess? Well, if you would have guessed a $1,200 pair of headsets for recording number one, you would have been right. But if you were to have guessed a $1,200 pair of headsets for recording number two, you would have been way off. Recording number two was actually recorded with Core Aviation KA-1 headsets, which are $200. And this is why Core Aviation headsets are my favorite pair of headsets to recommend to students. I've had mine for nine years. They've never broken down on me. And when you compare the clarity to that $1,200 pair of headset clarity, they really can't be beaten. And for right now, up until May 10th, they are partnering with Part-Time Pilot for a 20% off coupon code. It's just Part-Time Pilot 20 to get 20% off on checkout. Just enter that into the coupon field on checkout and you get 20% off an already great and affordable pair of headsets. So go ahead and check that out with the link in the show notes. Hello, everybody. This is Nick, the host of the Part-Time Pilot Audio Ground School podcast. Thank you for joining me. If you're joining, then you are interested in some check ride prep because that's what we're going to be continuing today. So two weeks ago, we were doing, or the last few weeks, we've been talking about what to expect on your check ride so you know exactly what to expect, how it's going to go. And then we started getting into the specifics of it and even doing, throwing out some possible situational based, scenario based questions you're going to get from your DPE that are part of your oral exam. So two weeks ago, we talked about, you know, you get there, you get to the oral exam, you shake their hand, you, you meet them, you pay them, and then you start getting into proving that you're qualified for the flight. So that goes over your documentation, you know, your logbook, your endorsements, all that stuff. Then last week we transitioned, you know, you're going to transition during the check ride to proving that your aircraft is airworthy for that day. So you'll go over the aircraft documentation, the aircraft inspections, required equipment, all that stuff. And we covered that last week, and we even covered, you know, some scenario-based oral exam questions you might get about the weight and balance. So that was a good episode last week, and today we're going to continue on with that. And the next part of your oral exam is the cross-country planning scenario that the DPE is going to give you. So you're going to go over, you're going to lay out your flight plan, you're going to have your nav log, you're going to have your charts up, all the weather information, and you're going to go over entire flight plan with the examiner you're gonna say okay we're taking off here about this time at this weight i did the weight and balance here which i just showed you and then we're gonna travel to this checkpoint we're gonna climb to this altitude we're gonna step them all the way through that scenario and then when you go fly you're actually gonna fly you're gonna file that flight plan and you're gonna start flying that cross-country flight and about the second or third maybe fourth checkpoint who knows your examiner is going to kind of cut that cross-country flight short and then have you do you know some maneuvers or maybe a diversion or a emergency simulation something like that and then pretty much the cross-country flight part is done you've shown them you can do a couple checkpoints you can navigate stuff like that now they're going to test you on other things and then after they do maneuvers and all that stuff then you'll come back for landings and stuff like that so that's kind of how it's going to go but you're going to plan it and do your nav log and everything as if you're flying the complete flight for that day. And they'll probably give you this scenario a couple days sooner. And if you hear that loud, as you guys know, it's been a while since I've said this on the podcast, but I record right next to airplanes landing. And there was just a go around by a 737. So right in the approach path. So go arounds are loud if you heard that. Anyway, so let's get back to what we were talking about. Yeah, so that's how it's going to go. So in today's episode, we're going to talk about that scenario your check ride scenario, what that the DP is going to give to you, tips to on what to look out for and how to plan your flight plan accordingly to make the DPE happy. Now we're not going to go over 
step-by-step how to plan a cross-country flight. We've already done that on the podcast in the online ground school. Now, I will say in our checkride prep course, we do review each part of that, you know, measuring courses, calculating airspeeds, all that stuff. We do review all that stuff and we add in some things to look out for that the DPE might ask for or might ask about. And we talk about that in the course, but we're not going to review that again on the podcast because you can just go back and listen to those episodes. But we're going to go over the scenario, what your DP is looking out for, some tips, some things that they might throw at you to try and stump you. And then at the end, and we have this in the check ride prep course as well, we have a checklist to make sure you did everything in your cross country flight plan. So we'll go over that checklist as kind of like a summary of what you need to do for your flight plan scenario. So before we do that, I just have a couple announcements. We have a lot going on here at Part-Time Pilot. Some exciting times. And today, this episode is dropping on April 29th. And the first thing I want to mention, which you may have heard in a little ad blurb, but we have the spring scholarship coming up in the end of May. So as soon as kind of May starts, I'm going to start talking about that some more, allowing people to... So maybe the second week of May or so, I'll throw out an applications for people to apply to that scholarship. But we've been trying to get sponsors to that scholarship. And one of my favorite aviation companies out there, the Core Aviation Headsets, they heard about our scholarship. They donated $500 to the scholarship. And on top of that, they gave part-time pilot listeners, you know, followers, a 20% off coupon code for their headsets. Now, if you've Listen to any of the ads I've done in the previous episodes on Core Aviation. I've had no affiliation other than then that I really liked their product. I've had their headsets for nine years and it's never died on me. And then I reached out to them to be an affiliate because I liked them so much a couple years ago. And they're like, yeah, we can give you guys a 10% discount. So they're bumping that up to 20 and but real quick, before we get to that, I have a few announcements. We have a lot of stuff going on here at Part-Time Pilot. And so I want to break it down, kind of everything that's going on. This episode is dropping on April 29th. The first thing we need to talk about is tomorrow on April 30th, in the morning at 9 a.m., I am sending out via email and on social media at 10 a.m. So through email, so if you're one of our email subscribers, you'll get it at 9 a.m., but it's going to be an access link to our IFR Ground School Beta Group 2. So a couple months ago, we released our IFR ground school for just 25 people. We got a little bit more people in because it was very popular and actually crashed crashed our website. It was so popular. But we got that figured out. We got some, some more people in for a beta group because the IFR ground school wasn't quite complete. All the lessons and the visual aids and the quizzes and the practice tests were complete for students to get their endorsements and all that stuff. But there were some more videos that I wanted to make. There was audio lessons that you guys love about the private pilot course. So I still wanted to get that done. Now, I'm not 100% complete with that yet, but I've been incorporating feedback from the first beta group and I've made probably over 20 videos and like 50 audio lessons in that time. So I've been really hard at work. Towards the end of the lessons, I still have some videos and audio lessons to make for you guys. So it's not 100% complete, but I keep getting people asking when I'm going to open it again. So since I could use some more feedback, especially on the lessons towards the end, I am going to open up for a second beta group. Okay, so it's only the first 25 people to sign up on April 30th. So that's tomorrow. If you're listening to this on Monday, April 29th, that's Tuesday, April 30th. And at 9 a.m., I am going to send out that to our email subscribers. And then at 10 a.m., I'm going to post it on social media. This is my way of kind of spacing it out so our website isn't hammered and doesn't crash on us again. (laughs) Shouldn't, hopefully not this time. We're only taking the first 25. And so you get $75 off the price of the IFR ground school, the the final price that it's going to be. So that's $175 total for lifetime access. You get all the updates for free, all that stuff. You get your endorsement. We've actually had Two people from the first beta group finish up and get their endorsement. They haven't taken the test yet, just as I'm speaking. So we'll see how they do on that. But they seem really prepared. So we're excited about that. But yeah, so that is tomorrow. So 
If you want, you can go to our website and sign up as a subscriber if you want to get that emailed to you at 9 a.m. Again, just the first 25 for IFR Beta Group 2. That is tomorrow. Okay, the second thing I want to talk about is we have in May, we're going to talk about our spring scholarship. Probably about the second week, I'll send out the applications for our spring scholarship. It's open to anybody who is flight training in the U.S. So it's different from our other fall, winter, and summer scholarships, which are open to only members of part-time pilot ground schools. But this one is open to anyone who is flight training. So if you're not a member of our ground schools, that's okay. You can apply to this. And what we're going to do is we're going to take a bunch of applications, and then I'm going to narrow it down to some finalists. And I'm going to make these finalists make me a short video. And then we're going to play the video and the audio of the video on the podcast and on our social media. And then we're going to have all the followers of Part-Time Pilot and the listeners vote on who they think should win the scholarship. This scholarship is a little bit different because I take donations for the scholarships. I want you guys to decide on the scholarship. It's not all my money. So to remind you guys, I donate $1,000 for this scholarship to start it off. And then I'm going to start a GoFundMe, and I already have. We haven't gotten any just single donations yet, so if you're looking to maybe donate or share that, please do so. The link will be in the show notes. But I'm going to try and push that hard. But what I've also been doing this year is getting corporate sponsorships. And the latest corporate sponsorship that we just got was from my favorite aviation headset company, Core Aviation. They donated $500. So shout out to Core Aviation you guys are awesome. And then on top of that, they are doing, just for part-time pilot listeners and followers, a 20% off coupon code for their headsets, which you guys know, if you've been listening to the podcast, I love their headsets. I've had mine for nine years. They're great quality. I thought they'd just be a great, you know, good first headset for me. And now I've had them for nine years. They're awesome. Couldn't recommend them enough. And you get 20% off and they're already very affordable. So that coupon code is part-time pilot 20 so part-time pilot 20, no spaces, and just put that in on the checkout page on the coupon code field, and you'll get 20% off. So again, shout out to Core Aviation and a great time to buy a headset to a supporter of the scholarship, Core Aviation. And then be on the lookout in a couple of weeks. We'll talk about more on the podcast for that scholarship application and hearing all about that. Okay, I have one more announcement on May 1st. So May 1st at midnight, so the end, you get the whole day May 1st, but after May 1st, the Private Pilot Online Ground School price is going to raise by $50. So we talked about this before on why we are raising our prices, but I've never been more confident in that course's ability to prepare students and how we compare to the competition around us. And I think it's about dang time we get taken seriously out there as the best ground school because by all the features we certainly are so this price just puts us next to the other ones that are already even priced more than that so yeah it's long overdue i've held off for a while but just letting you know and i wanted to give you guys the ability to get in at the lower price after may 1st it's going to go up and that's my last announcement so let's get to the check ride prep course and talking about your cross-country scenario Okay, so let's talk about the scenario, the cross-country flight scenario that your DPE or examiner is going to give you prior to your checkride. So as mentioned earlier, when you schedule your checkride with the examiner, he, she is going to give you a scenario for your checkride that you guys will play out. You will create a cross-country plan and perform all performance calculations for the scenario and have it ready the day of your checkride. So you'll have your nav log, all the calculations, all the weather data, all of it. Then during your oral exam, you'll review this plan and the examiner will quiz you as you walk them through it. So this is part of the oral exam and they're going to ask you kind of situational based questions throughout. When you get to your flight, you will also play this scenario out the way until the first one or two checkpoints, maybe two or three checkpoints into it. The examiner is going to dictate that, and it's your job to continue on your planned flight unless they change the scenario with an emergency diversion or something. So they might not just tell you your cross-country flight is now over. They might say, hey, you just, you're just you seeing smoke in the cockpit. What do you do? It would be your job to do that emergency scenario and divert and end your cross-country flight, right? Obviously, you're not going to continue on your flight in that scenario. So this means you will also file a flight plan and open it before your flight. 
The scenario is not just going to be to plan a flight from here to there. It is going to cover as many aspects of piloting as the examiner chooses, and they are going to build these additional aspects based off what you missed on your FA written exam. So if you miss a question about fuel requirements, you better believe that they are going to choose a scenario that makes you really think about fuel requirements. Perhaps they will choose a final destination that most general aviation aircraft can barely make it to on a full tank, for example. Let's go over a list of other things they may try to sneakily add into your scenario and what that might mean for you. A route as long or longer than the range of the aircraft. So this is something they might put into your scenario they might want to look out for. They want to make sure you plan a fuel stop and consider fuel requirements and risk management when they do this. Another thing, they might direct the route that goes over mountains. Here, they would want you to consider all the risks associated with mountain ranges. Thunderstorms, turbulence, mountain winds, minimum altitudes, safe landing spots, etc. Or... They might say you went to a social event the night before or the day before or something like that. Here, they want you to consider pilot risks as part of the I'm safe checklist. You know, did you drink anything related to drugs and alcohol, right? That You may have partaken in. That's kind of what they're getting at. Did you get enough sleep? Do you feel sick, etc. Another thing they might throw at you is you're traveling to a destination on a timeline. Here they want you to consider outside pressures. Again, kind of the stress in I'm safe or hazardous attitudes that would make you want to complete the trip when maybe you shouldn't. Another thing, you or a passenger went scuba diving in the last 24 hours. Here they want you to consider the effects of blood oxygen levels after scuba diving and know the procedures for flying after scuba diving. Another thing, if your passenger is drunk, they might throw in some sort of scenario where your passenger is drunk or has had any drinks or wants to drink, something like that. Obviously, they want you to consider the rules of carrying passengers who have knowingly drank because you can't do that. <laughs> Another scenario, your flight leaves in the afternoon. Okay, so look out if that's part of your scenario that you're leaving in the afternoon. Here, they want you to consider the risks of night flying, right? If you're getting close to night and any preparations and considerations or rules that go with night flying. If you miss a meal somehow, they might throw in that you miss a meal. So you'd want to, that's the E and I'm safe, the eating, right? You need to be well nourished, especially for longer trips. Let's see here. You have to change aircraft last minute and the new aircraft is high performance or has a glass cockpit or something you're not familiar with. Here again, they want you to consider additional aircraft ratings and endorsements that you might need for that aircraft, as well as the difference between proficiency and currency and familiarity with that new aircraft. The destination airport is somewhere high elevation or high temperature or high humidity. Here they want you to consider the effects of density altitude, right? So think high elevation, high temperature, high humidity. Think, oh, okay, they're talking about density altitude because those things make the density altitude go up. That one happened to me right there on my check ride scenario. They might ask you to use a specific date in the near past for your weather data. They might say, use the weather data from this day. And so you might want to look at specific of that weather data. They might have chosen that date specifically because maybe there was specific weather they wanted you to consider, right? Maybe thunderstorms in the near area, high temperatures, maybe low ceiling, low visibility, icing, you know, some smoke or something. If they do that, everything they do, they might do for some sort of reason because they want you to find something in what they're giving you to talk about and ask you about. So just be on the lookout. Let's see here. Maybe it's high or unusual winds on takeoff and landing. They might throw that into a scenario. Obviously, they want you to consider your aircraft and your personal limitations on things like crosswinds for landing and takeoff. Maybe your route goes over a known sp special airspace area. So again, if you let's say you missed questions on the FAA written on special use airspace, like TFRs, MOAs, restricted military training routes, and that sort of stuff. Be on the lookout for that, especially if they direct your route You know, through those parts. You can pretty much guess they're going to ask you about that when you're showing them that your route is flying right through like a MOA or something. 
Another one, you are asked to go around specific terrain or areas such that you switch hemispherical rules. This is a big one. So they might tell you to go around a mountain or something. And so be on the lookout for, you know, if you're changing from going westerly to easterly during that cruise flight, you have to change your hemispherical rule and, and fly it at different cruise altitudes. So be on the lookout for that. So these are all just some of the things examiners will try to get you on. In reality, the whole entire ACS, Airman Certificate Standards, is open to them as we've talked about. Now that we have a decent idea of the scenario that they're going to give you, let's get into how we plan the cross-country plan so that we cover every single thing and leave no questions left unanswered. And as I talked about before, we're not going to go in every single detail. You can go back to the online ground school audio lessons that we talked about to cover those in specifics. But before we do that, I just want to do one possible examiner question that might come up in this situation is what possible risks, if any, do you assess with your flight scenario? So that's kind of an open-ended question. And we talked about all the sort of kind of scenario situations that they can throw in there. And that's sort of the general question they want you to answer with all those kind of tidbits of information that they give you. What possible risks, if any, do you assess with your flight scenario? So you might say, want to use your I'm safe and pave checklist to think about things with your self assessment, the aircraft's assessment, the aircraft dangers, you know, everything. So not just I'm safe with your self assessment, but also with the aircraft and the environment. So that's where PAVE comes in, right? So this could be things as, you know, are you familiar with the flight plan? Are you familiar with the aircraft? Are you current? Are you proficient? Terrain, traffic, weather, distance, fuel, stress, you know, eating, alcohol, all that stuff we talked about. So just think about when they give you a scenario, think about the possible risks, if any, that you could assess that they could ask you about. Let's go over just kind of the checklist we have here of what you need to plan in that cross-country flight plan to remember sort of everything. And then as I always say, for your check ride, if you used any data, right, to make any calculations that's in your nav log, just print that off and bring it with you. Even if it's on your iPad, have a physical copy. You never know what happens to your iPad or what your DPE might say happens to your iPad, whatever. You want to have that physical hard copy backup. So for example, if you got winds aloft data from a specific winds aloft report, just print that off. Bring it with you because they might say on some certain calculations, where'd you get that wind information? Instead of being like, uh, uh, the wind's a law from, I uh, can't remember the website or blah, blah, blah. Just be like, yep, here, right here, here's the date, blah, 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 this station, this altitude, that's what I used right there. Boom, it's going to show you you're prepared, you have credible sources for all the information that you used in the calculations, and you're going to look good doing that, and you have the physical backups. So what's the checklist of what you need to go again? If you want details on each of these steps, you can go back to the lessons that we've already covered in the online ground school. But here is sort of the order and the steps that I take when I plan a cross-country flight. Perform weight and balance. Use your POH, AFM, weight and balance worksheet and charts to calculate. Do this first. I do this first to avoid any rework. If I need to change fuels, it changes my weight and I would have to redo it. To plot a straight line course on the chart. Using your chart and ruler, draw a straight line from your departure airport to your landing airport. Three, determine checkpoints. Examine that straight line path and correct it for easy to find checkpoints, avoiding terrain, avoiding airspace, etc. Record your checkpoints in your cross country planner. Four, gather weather reports and forecasts. Gather local weather via area forecasts and TAFs at your landing and takeoff airports and gather in-route weather information via winds aloft, area forecasts, and air mitts, sigmits, and pyreps. Five, gather known traffic delays at airports and in-route from TFRs, NOTAMs, and pyreps. Six, gather runway lengths, diagrams, and other information. This is from terminal area and sectional charts, plus AFD chart supplements. Gather info for alternate runways as well. Seven, determine cruise altitudes. Using a chart, we choose a cruise altitude based off terrain, airspace, obstacles, and don't forget the hemispherical rule. Number eight, determine distances to each checkpoint. Measuring off your chart using your plotter and ruler. Nine, 
estimate fuel required for flight using the total distance you just gathered and a conservative fuel consumption rate and then don't forget fuel for taxi run up approach descent and reserve you want to estimate your fuel here before we do the rest of the calculations this allows you to determine whether you might need to plan in a fuel stop or not if we plan it in now we won't have to rework a bunch of calculations later if we say oh shoot I'm not going to have enough fuel. I need to actually plan a fuel stop. Let's figure that out now by estimating it a little conservatively, and we always want to be conservative with fuel. Step 10, find your true course to each checkpoint. Read this value off the plotter using your plotter on your chart. 11, calculate the magnetic course to each checkpoint. That's going to be your true course plus or minus the variation from your chart, isogonic line. 12, Record winds and temperatures for cruise altitudes. You're going to use winds aloft to interpolate at your cruise altitudes. 13. Determine total distance to climb. Using your fuel, time, and distance to climb chart for your aircraft and your aircraft POH AFM. 14. Adjust checkpoints for top of climb. This is a personal preference. It makes things easier for me. I like to have a checkpoint right at the top of my climb so that I know Right when I'm at the top of my climb, I'm reached my altitude, I should be around that checkpoint. And then the next phase of flight, I can just calculate it all as cruise. And everything before that, I can calculate all as climb. It makes things a lot easier, not only on the flight planning, but also on the flight execution. Um, let's see here. 15. Determine altitude and fuel to each checkpoint during climb. Using distance and an interpolated temperature to back calculate altitude on fuel time distance to climb chart while also calculating fuel to each checkpoint. So this is basically just saying if there's checkpoints before you reach your top of climb, determine what kind of altitude you should be at for that checkpoint to give yourself a check, and then also the fuel you're going to take to climb. So that's what we're talking about there. 16, determine total distance to descend. Again, use your fuel time distance to descend chart for your aircraft. 17, adjust checkpoints for start of descent. Just like the top of climb, I like to have a top of descent or the start of descent checkpoint so when I get to that checkpoint it tells me start my descent 18 altitude to each checkpoint during descent so if you have multiple checkpoints during your descent you kind of want to um, give a calculation of what altitude you should be at so that you can plan your descent and you know have that planned out right if the more you plan out the more you know you have ready and what you can expect the better your flight is going to go the less unexpected things the less stress you're going to have while flying it makes things better trust me 19. Record winds and temperatures for climb and descent altitudes. So those altitudes we just talked about, you want to gather the wind information for those altitudes at those checkpoints so we can calculate other things at those checkpoints. 20. Record targeted indicated airspeed during climb. So during our climb, we always target an indicated airspeed. So let's put that in our nav log, what we're going to target during climb. We'll use this indicated airspeed going forward. In step 22, which is calculate true airspeed to each checkpoint during climb. So we're going to start with our indicated airspeed, use our E6B to get our true airspeed during climb. And then step 23, engine power setting during each checkpoint during cruise and descent. So after climb, we basically need to determine true airspeed a little bit different way because we're not targeting an indicated airspeed during cruise. We're more so targeting an engine power setting. So that's what we're going to start with. And these charts are in your POH AFM. Again, using your RPM altitude and temperature at each checkpoint, you're going to determine the engine power setting using the engine performance chart. Then with that, step 24, we'll find our true airspeed to each checkpoint during cruise and descent. And again, I like to say calculate descent the same as I do cruise in terms of true airspeed, ground speed, and fuel consumption because it's a little more conservative. I don't do anything different for descent. And then to do this, to find true airspeed during these phases, you're going to use the engine power setting and best power cruise performance chart. So now that we know the engine power setting we target with our particular RPM in cruise flight, we can then use the best power cruise performance chart to back out a true airspeed. Step 25, using that true airspeed, we'll get the ground speed to each checkpoint, climb, and cruise. So again, we just start with true airspeed and our wind data and our E6B tool to get a ground speed. We'll also, at the same time, for step 26, get our wind correction angle to each checkpoint. That will allow us in step 27 to calculate a magnetic heading to each checkpoint. 
Now that we have our magnetic heading and ground speed, using the ground speed for step 28, we can get the time to each checkpoint. Again, because now we have distance and ground speed, we can get time. Now that we have time, we can now use the fuel. We can come up with the fuel to each checkpoint. So it's going to be the time and our fuel consumption rate, again, which will come from our POH or AFM. And we've already done this for climb, but for cruise and descent, we'll use a, a cruise fuel consumption rate, again, from our POH AFM. Number 30, we'll calculate the total distance of our total trip. You know, just add it all up. Number 31, we'll get our total time. Number 32, we'll get our total fuel. Number th And in that includes, you know, the fuel from climb, the fuel from cruise and descent, and then our taxi and run-up fuel, our approach and landing fuel, and reserve fuel. So we want to make sure to add that all in there and be conservative. Number 33, we'll have our takeoff weights. So first takeoff uses the takeoff weight or gross weight from our weight and balance calculations. Our second takeoff subtract fuel burned weight. Okay, so it's six pounds per gallon of fuel that we're going to expect on our flight if we, have, if we don't refuel anywhere. So that's going to be, so we're saying we're going to fly to this airport, we're going to land, and then we're going to take off and we didn't refuel right? That's what we're assuming here. If we did refuel, we would have a different weight, right? And then our landing weight, right? Our first landing weight would be took off. We burnt all that fuel getting there. And then so that we subtract that weight and we land with that. And then let's say we don't fill up. We take off again to come back home. Then we would subtract the, the trip home's weight of fuel for our final landing weight. So you want those uh, takeoff and landing weights for so you can have a complete weight and balance story, right, for all your takeoffs and landings. And you also need those takeoff and landing weights for step 35 and 36, which is our takeoff and landing distances. So you'll want to use those weights and the temperature information and all that, the runway information to, and use the charts in your POH AFM to calculate how long it's going to take you to take off and how long it's going to take you to land at each airport. And that is your final step of a cross-country flight plan. It's a lot, I know, but this checklist helped me a ton. It's available as a PDF download in our Checkride Prep bonus course, and it's also in here in a lesson. And we also have a cross-country flight planning guide and a cross-country planning ebook, cross-country planning video series. So we have a lot of cross-country flight planning tools because it's really important on your Checkride. So yeah. All right, so that is it for this episode. Next episode, we're going to talk about more checkride prep, talking about a little bit more of the oral exam, you know, what else you might get from the oral exam. But pretty much if you've nailed, you know, showing your qualifications, showing your aircraft qualifications, going over your cross-country flight plan, they're going to work in their oral exam questions into all of that. And then this might be the point here where they kind of throw in some other ones. So we're going to talk about just some other questions you might get on the oral exam. And then we'll talk about how the practical check ride, it, the practical part of it, the actual flight part of it is going to go. So that is coming up in the next week or so. And then we're going to cover a, we're going to play a mock check ride I did with a student that should be really, really helpful. So the obviously the oral part of that. And yeah, so thank you for joining me. Remember, tomorrow, April 30th at 9 a.m., I'm going to be sending out an email for the first 25 people who want to sign up for the second beta group of our IFR online ground school for $75 off. And at 10 a.m., I'll post it on social media. So be sure to get that if you're looking for our IFR ground school for $75 off, lifetime access, all updates included. Come join us in there. It's going to be awesome. And it already is awesome. We just want a little bit more feedback, and I want to make a couple more videos towards the end of, end of that lesson before I call it complete, but people were wanting in, so we're going to let them in. And then, oh yeah, and don't forget about Core Aviation's part-time pilot 20 deal. That's 20% off, and that deal expires on May 10th as well. So you got some deadlines coming up for you guys. All right, thanks for listening. Catch you next week.